This is the third in four videos that describe how strain gauges are used in uh, force and torque sensors. This uh, video and set of slides discusses how we uh, need to integrate a mechanical elastic type structure with the strain gauges to get the kind of function that we want uh, to measure uh, either a certain type of force or torque. Uh, we like to use strain gauges especially in beam type sensors. The beam structure geometry is often used to, to design different configurations of force and torque sensors. They have easy geometry so that we can design and analyze the structure and they can be, the strain gauges can be easily mounted um, and configured to achieve different types of functions. So for example, in the very common cantilevered beam, um, it's very easy to remember that the stiffness is easy to predict based on knowing the Young's modulus, the area moment of inertia, and the length of the beam. And um, also by being able to calculate the, the bending uh, moment across this beam here, we can uh, uh, understand you know, what is the stress, the, the bending-induced stress, say, along the beam. So wherever we place a strain gauge, we can easily estimate what what the strain might be and in that way you know given strain remember with a gauge with the given the gauge factor uh, we can uh, estimate that we're going to get a certain kind of resistance change and so we can design sensors easily this way i've included this table here for for your reference this shows different axially and uh, cantilever cantilever uh, beams and how Strain gauges can be mounted on them for different applications, either for measuring strain or for measuring forces, the applied forces. So here, again, these are all actually loaded beams. I'm going to focus mostly on the tip-loaded beam um, loads here just to show you, you know, how sometimes the, the configuration we really like the most is, a, is where you have four, all four strain gauges, two on top and two on the bottom. And this is a very common, what we sometimes call a full you know, full bridge because we have, uh, we'll configure these four strain gauges into a Wheatstone bridge, right? Each of these arms will have a strain gauge. And where we put those strain gauges on the beam and then how we wire them up into a full bridge is important for us to get the right kind of um, output voltage. Remember, the whole idea behind putting something into a Wheatstone bridge is so that changes in resistance are converted into changes in voltage, which are then which is then the quantity that we can easily measure. Look at also, you know, this this kind of a configuration, a cantilevered beam, tip loaded. Um, it has compensation for both axial and torsion load. So, if I twist this beam, or I um, apply an axial load, it it the the, resi the resistive strain gauge is the uh, rather, the total res the total bridge output won't change. That's kind of neat. So you can twist that uh, beam. Uh, you can actually load it, and it's only going to be sensitive to uh, bending uh, stress. Um, it's also temperature compensated. Since you have four strain gauges, if the beam changes temperature, all the strain gauges will change the same. So in that sense, you won't get any delta V for temperature changes. Very nice. So again, this table summarizes all of these different types of configurations. And you can find tables like this in textbooks as well. I wanted to show you also another uh, table here that shows you how you can get different types. Uh, you can design different types of beam structures. Here's an axial strain. Again, here's the bending strain that we just talked about. Again, the four. Uh, this is a really good one to remember uh, in general. Bending, we're, we're sensing bending strain only. So it's a nice design element. Uh, but there's also shear strain type beams and also torsional strain type configurations. Again, you should refer to textbooks in general. It's also a really good handbook called the Strain Gauge. If you ever get into this field, Strain Gauge Handbook, um, that's a very good reference uh, that you can find in the library. Uh, for any of these designs, again, gauge placement is critical. Uh, where you put the gauges, the kind of gauges, note these are uh, sometimes these these can sense the the shear strain in the tor to to detect torsional strain. Uh, so can these here, right? So uh, again, many different kind of strain gauges available for different applications. 
Um, recently ran across this uh, figure also, again, this was in the string gauge uh, handbook. Um, we're very familiar again with the cantilever beam with tip load, but you can improve on this design and I've summarized uh, in this table improvements. The basic cantilever beam, again, easy to make and mount gauges, but uh, most of this beam that's being used uh, is not useful because the string gauges are just at the very end here. So um, uh, it, there's a lot of mass added and so there's some neat things that you can do. You can um, increase the, the strain by you know cutting out the area where you mount the strain gauges. You can also hollow it out to reduce the mass. And there's also a design effect here where you can taper the area where the strain gauges are mounted. What this does is it gives you equal strain across the actual strain gauge. Very subtle, um, but I just thought I'd throw that in there. Again, that's a reference from the strain gauge handbook as well. Now on this slide, showing you the whole combination. We have the Wheatstone Bridge, showing those that the, the four gauges and how they're mounted on a typical cantilever beam. This ends up giving you a really nice relationship for that change in voltage as you get change in resistance. Show you that there's there's actually a nice relationship here. It shows you that if you have you know, what the output voltage will be from this Wheatstone bridge, here V sub S is the input voltage. And um, so this is where that balance condition comes from. You can show that if R1 over R2 is equal to R3 over R4, basically this v naught is equal to zero, right? So now if you want to, you can show by, I won't derive it here, but there's a change then in the output voltage, again, per unit input resistance. I'm sorry, per unit applied voltage, excitation voltage. And you, you get a very nice relationship here that depends just on gauge factor. And, and the strain of each of these strain gauges as long as you mount them properly. So note this very carefully. Gauge 1 and gauge 4 are on top here. Gauge 2 and 3 are on the bottom because when you put a tip load on here, right, the two top ones will be in tension. The two bottom ones will be in compression, just as you would like. The sign, right, of the strain here is negative. The, the sign of the strain here is positive so when you add them up over here you get a, a four times and then you assume that again these you remember your solids this, this you assume that if you have a neutral axis on that beam that the strain of, of uh, on those is approximately the same so you have all of these four strains are adding up and you get a four times factor so you the final relationship you get a really nice little formula if you want to predict Hey, what's going to be my output voltage per unit excitation voltage? And all you need to know is the gauge factor and the strain at that point. Again, knowing the bending moment, you could estimate what that strain would be for a given applied force on a given beam, right? Very nice calculation that you can do to make sure you design your sensor appropriately. So that's why this cantilever beam is so popular in design of strain gauge beam sensors. In a related video, we're going to talk now more about how even though you get a nice relation, this delta V is still kind of small. You're still in the millivolt range, so it's important to have an amplifier. And there's a lot of information out there on amplifiers. I'll discuss an amplifier that we like to use in the lab um, to finish out the strain gauge uh, beam sensor system.